What I'd really like to do now is to just give you a little bit of background for those of you who don't know about the Northern Scientific Training Program and then introduce the speakers. So this is a program that has funded graduate students and sometimes undergraduates for many, many years to conduct field research in Canada's north. I was a recipient of an NSTP award when I was a graduate student, and I'm sure lots of other faculty in this room that went to school in Canada were as well. It's really been instrumental in helping students get their field research done and um, in ways that, and, and to do the kind of research that they might not otherwise have been able to do. So it's been a great and successful program. Um, we always have students from the University of Calgary that apply to that. I'd like to see the numbers of applications go way, way up. Um, uh, the more applications we get, the more money we're able to access. So that's important. And it's been a little low in the last few years. So if you're thinking about doing field research in the North, it's definitely a program you should look into and work with your advisor. So this year, um, as I mentioned, this is the first year we've asked the students who've been given awards to speak to us about their research. And we hope that as the word spreads, we'll have more and more students. And maybe we'll have to take up two speaker series talks next year. Um, and the thing that's great about the NSTP is they're open to any discipline. And so students from all fields of social science and natural science and even sometimes the arts and humanities get awards and, and that also makes it one of the few student opportunities out there that's broadly accessible to the whole um, student body at the university. So having said that, uh, we'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight talks today. We're not sure if the, the last speaker is going to make it or not. And we're going to start with uh, Michelle Blade, who's a student in the Department of Geography. And her talk today is entitled, Hydrology Impacts of a Polythermal Glacier on an Icing in Continuous Permafrost. So, Michelle, that's you. Come on up. All right, well, I'm Michelle Blade from the Department of Geography, as you just said. And uh, let's take you back to July 1st, 2014, and it was time to head out into the field. So, Bilet Island is located in the Canadian High Arctic directly north of Baffin Island. It's above the tree line and within the continuous permafrost zone. It is a dry and cold climate with a mean annual air temperature of minus 15 degrees Celsius. However, that temperature has been rising to minus 14 degrees Celsius according to recent literature. Known for its glaciated landscape, Violet Island is protected within Sumilic National Park. It is uninhabited, with the closest town being, in, or being Pond Inlet, which is located directly across the Clip Sound. As a research team, we flew from Calgary, Alberta, up to Bilet Island well, using domestic flights. Thank you very much for the support in order to fund that. <laughs> and then uh, helicoptered across into uh, Bilet Island in order to conduct our three weeks of research. So in the high Arctic, the hydrological regime is um, characterized by having liquid water flow in the spring, summer, and fall, and then having a cessation of flow during freeze up in the winter. However, the area in the front of Fountain Glacier, which is also known as the proglacial area right here, um, is special because um, ever since 1948, um, there, an, a perennial icing has appeared here. Now we know that this perennial icing occurs in the winter time because um, in order for liquid water to freeze, the temperature needs to be below zero degrees Celsius, and that's most commonly happens in the winter. However, what I just said earlier, that there not being liquid water flow in the winter, it begs the question, if my question comes up, where is this water coming from? This is an important question to answer because currently water and land use managers um, aren't taking liquid water flow in the winter into account. And also with climate change, um, being able to um, uh, characterize where sites like this are happening where there's liquid water flow in the winter is um, well, it's important in order to uh, predict where future sites of this could also occur. So my hypothesis of the, is that it had something to do with Fountain Glacier, which is located up valley. There are typically two types of glaciers in the Arctic. The one is a cold-based glacier, where um, all the ice is below zero degrees Celsius. And the second is a polythermal glacier, which is what uh, Fountain Glacier is, where you have a uh, cold um, uh, ice that's encompassing uh, warm ice in the center. Warm ice is defined as zero degrees Celsius ice so that water is able to flow through the ice crystals. My hypothesis 
was that lakes that butt up against the glacier up valley were supplying this water so that the water could flow through this warm ice and then transmit via a spring um, out the front of the glacier and then therefore generate the icing in the winter. So I was all excited that I was going to be going up to Violet Island and get up to my lakes and do all this research at these up valley lakes. But we get there, we fly over the helicopter and there's this huge crevasse field which um, if one of those would have fallen in, it would have taken me and my little boat doing my research out pretty quickly. So um, that brings us to title slide number two of that research is out the door. And I have a brand new project. So July 8th, 2014. <laughs> Instead of focusing on that spring and how it's connected up to the Up Valley Lakes, I'm now going to look more into that uh, spring and how it's affecting the icing at the front. So this Pro Glacial Lake area is unique in that it's ice dammed on three sides. It's first ice dammed by the Fountain Glacier Up Valley. Second, this Pro Glacial Lake is ice dammed by the icing Down Valley. And then third, the Pro Glacial Lake is um, ice dammed via bottom fast ice and permafrost beneath it. I've, uh, in the blue, outlined um, that over the course of the study area where we ended up defining where that proglacial ice is, or the, the limits of that lake. Within the lake, um, that's floating ice. As we're there in the summertime, there is water flowing through this area. Some is coming off the glacier itself via the superglacial streams. Other is coming um, in through the lateral streams. And then there is the spring, which is located somewhere in this area. And I know that there used to be springs in this area because they've been um, seen by previous researchers. To give you an idea of scale, um, the terminus of this glacier going all the way across is about 400 meters. And I got to cross that stream there every day when it was able to be crossed in order to get to my study site. So my new research question became, how does the icing influence the proglacial lake in July 2014? Four objectives were laid out. First was to infer how the icing was formed. The second was to measure degradation of the icing through the summer and how it was changing the, um, the limits of the lake itself. The third was to locate that spring, which seems to be an upcut or a theme through most of this talk. And the fourth is to characterize the water flow through the proglacial area. Methods used in order to meet those objectives are ice characterization, time-lapse photography, bathymetry, and dye tracing. So ice characterization. This is a side view of the icing itself um, from the summer of 2014. Um, just to give you an indication, this, uh, come back here a second. Um, this is 50 centimeters tall, and these are ice crystals that form when you have a pool of water. In this case, it would be about 50 centimeters um, deep that um, is uh, quite calm and is exposed to cold air at, um, at the surface that allows the ice crystals to form and perpetuate all the way down to the bottom, basically forming um, these large stabby shards, which is not... I sometimes question what exactly I was doing out there when I'm in a, in a rubber dinghy and these shards are coming at me on a regular basis and I'm thinking all I want is some higher education. <laughs> so through this I can, I can uh, uh, assume that um, this lake formed in the late winter because it's near the top and that it was of, de of a depth of approximately 50 centimeters. And using those techniques I characterized um, other icing areas as well. Uh, the next thing I did is I put up eight time-lapse cameras to um, take in the proglacial area. I'm just going to show you a few slides from uh, those time-lapse cameras. The first, this is going to start off at time zero, and just to orient yourself, there's the glacier on the far right, your right, yeah, and the um, icing on the left of the proglacial area in the center. Um, when we started out, the, I, the lake was predominantly covered in ice with some melting taking place where there's a lower albedo um, edge right there. By day four, you have more uh, melting taking place where that water's flowing across the glacier, as I was looking or telling you about earlier. It wasn't all sunny weather. I was promised 24-hour sunshiny days, and it was not. <laughs> uh, by day 12, uh, there's more melting taking place, and make note that the green-brown water right here changes color by day 16 and becomes quite turbid. I'll get back to that later on in my talk. 
once the um, the floating ice in the in the proglacial lake area um, melted away, I was then able to do a bathymetric survey and get an idea of what was going on underneath the lake. So most of this lake area has um, bottom fast ice about one meter below the surface. Right against the toe of the glacier, right here, um, the bottom fast ice has been eroded down to two and a half meters. And I have predict that has something to do with surficial water um, cutting a channel inside there. Um, this, what I would like to refer to as a tail, is just uh, more bottom fast ice that becomes more and more shallow until the shallowest point right there and then it just pinches out. And then um, of interest is the, um, the spring location, or hopefully the spring location, um, which is there, um, that uh, the, uh, the depth of the lake went down to four meters. And to characterize the flow through the area, I did dye tracing. Most of the time, the dye tracing was inconclusive, but inconclusive is still data. So sunny days were going well, and then uh, and I was doing pretty well um, um, taking off all my objectives, except that spring location was eluding me. And really, I need to find where that spring is in order to tie this whole thing together of the hydrology of the glacier tying in with the formation of the icing itself. So I was all set to really focus in on getting that spring, and then the bad weather moved in. And that's a cloud that just went over our camp and just stayed there for a good three days or so. And all we could do was sit and wait and observe, and observe we did. And uh, after a few days of that, uh, the glacier itself started to rumble and grumble and, uh, and crack, and subglacial water that's very sediment laden started coming out at the surface and pouring down the front in a number of different locations. And then after that, an eruption took place. Uh, on the other side of the lake, right over here, where that um, uh, four meter depth water was, uh, water started about a meter high coming out of the lake, which is pretty powerful considering that it has to go through four meters of stagnant water in order to get out of there. But keep in mind, well, so I started being convinced that that could really be where my spring location is. Uh, keep note that that green brown water is here and that it's not really sediment rich yet because right after that that whole lake went that turbid color and uh, a subglacial stream opened up at the bottom of the glacier on day 15. Now this same area on day 8 just had a bit of uh, superglacial clear water coming off of it and flowing down this way about 10 centimeters deep and by day 15 um, it was a turbid torrent going through there and eroded down a channel of 50 centimeters in just three days. So my conclusions with my newfound project is I didn't necessarily get to study what I thought I was going to study, but I'm really excited to um, take on this new task. And my uh, conclusions thus far is that the spring is most likely the liquid water source for the su or supplying the icing. The icing dams water flowing into the proglacial area, therefore forming the proglacial lake and the formation history of icing impacts how water flows through that proglacial area. So I want to thank all those researchers that came with me. There's the three of us from Calgary and then four researchers from uh, Britain that came over and um, definitely contributed to the fantastic time that we had up there. And then of course none of this would be possible without funding, so thanks to those funding sources as well. Our next speaker is Jesse Fraser, also from, I see we're funding quite a lot of stuff here for you, Bri. Thank you. Is um, Jesse Fraser, uh, from the, also from the Department of Geography, talking about multi-level resolution for archaeology using UAVs, uh, a case study from the Mackenzie Delta. And uh, I'm, pretty ex I'm pretty interested in this, actually. Um, so I changed the name of my, I'm, my name is Jesse Fraser. I'm a student in the Masters of GIS program in the geography department and my project is unmanned aerial vehicles and archaeology a case study in the Mackenzie Delta it's a little less of a mouthful that way I think um, unmanned aerial vehicles are also known as UAVs drones or UAS which means unmanned aerial systems um, this project was in was part of a larger project called the Arctic char project which stands for Arctic cultural heritage at risk and its main, main goals is to record and map and understand archaeological sites at risk in the Arctic. Um, sort of my purpose here was um, 
based around UAVs, and UAVs fly at lower elevations than traditional aerial photography, such as uh, satellites and uh, traditional airplanes, which means that you can get better resolution photography and imagery and more accurate elevation models. However, this comes with an issue. Um, UAVs can't cover as large an area as satellites or traditional airplanes, meaning that you have to be very, you have to understand what you need the data for and how you plan on covering it. With this in mind, my, one of my goals was to expose archaeologists to UAVs, which would help both me and archaeologists understand how UAVs can be useful for their research. The final, I think the final reason and purpose that it's important to understand UAVs is that it gives a greater amount of control to the users of the UAVs. It allows them to fly when they want and where they want, whereas more traditional systems such as satellites and airplanes have to be booked weeks, months, maybe even years in advance. It also allows users to control how the data is processed, whereas tr more traditional systems use, usually give the end user the data processed and complete. Um, the, the area of research was, uh, is called Kukpak, which means the big river in reference to the Mackenzie River. Um, the people who lived there were called the Kukpak Mute, or the people who live at Kukpak. They occupied this site between the 1500s to about 1900. Um, it's located on the, sh on the shores of the Mackenzie River, roughly where the Mackenzie River mutes the Beaufort Sea. Um, my more direct objectives for this was creating maps of Kukpak, both at a large full site scale and at each individual dig. Um, I, also was, I also wanted to map the coastline to create a baseline for future studies of erosion and how this erosion will affect these archaeological sites. Finally, at a more technical level, I want to examine the interaction between elevation, image to image overlap, and their impact on the accuracy of the data. Okay. So, this is the UAV that I used. It's a vertical takeoff and landing UAV with six props. Um, it's also known as the hexacopter. Um, attached to the bottom is this uh, ready to use, easy to find, off the shelf camera called the GF-1. Uh, the hexacopter is able to fly independently for about 15 minutes, give or take. Um, with a pre-programmed flight, the quote-unquote pilot basically has to flip a couple switches to take off and land, and that's about it. These are the batteries that are used. One of these batteries. Um, okay, so here's the imagery that, here's an example of the imagery that I was able to collect. It's quite, I like it, it's quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it, and then I like it even more when we zoom into that box, and you can get a good idea of the quality of the data. Um, everything is still quite clear. You get, um, to get an idea of scale, you get, you can look at that, uh, yellow target, which is about a foot by a foot. Um, we zoom in even more, and wow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's still really clear. Um, you can see there's an antler here that's really evident, um, foot marks, tidal stuff. It's just, it's really, really clear. Um, in some of the flights, we were able to collect data with uh, pixels smaller than one centimeter, which is really, really small. Um, on top of that, once the tar these targets at, were set up and the flights were pre-programmed, the flights are easy to repeat exactly the same. With a little bit of uh, change, et cetera, et cetera, I would say each flight, including preparation and flying time, takes around 40 minutes, meaning that it's fairly easy 
to repeat the same flight to collect data or different flights to collect more data, endless data. Um, when I came back looking at the data observations, I the first thing that I found was this is where I took off every day, took off, landed, and this sort of stuff. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, I was taking off and landing on ice wedge polygons without ever realizing it. And I think that points to one of the very interesting things that uh, UAVs offer is observations that aren't evident when you're on the ground and I think that also wouldn't be necessarily evident at lower resolution levels. Because if you, well, where's my pointer? Am I covering it? So that if that's a foot wide and that's roughly the same width, any sort of pixel resolution over 50 centimeters here, you're probably not going to be able to even see those. They're just going to be a blurry line. Uh, other observations to accurately map locations, steep locations such as cliffs, vertical faces, you need to increase you need to increase the overlap from image to image to avoid losing that data, which could be very critical. Um, on a less positive note, there's a lot of bushy vegetation such as this, and when taking imagery of that sort of stuff, you're not able to get an idea of the actual ground elevation, which is a seriously limiting factor. Um, and so when stitching the images together, a basic stitch, um, there's a positive linear relationship between the pixel size and the elevation at which the hexacopter flies at, which I think it was to be expected. Um, the final observation, which is not related to my data, but that how useful it was to be in the field with archaeologists on a day-to-day -day basis and how much it helped me understand what would be a useful tool for an archaeologist and what wouldn't in relation to UAVs. So with all this sort of stuff, um, I have several conclusions, I guess. Um, the, f the maps that were created of Kukpak were useful in certain portions because, most of all, they gave an alternate view of the sites that weren't previously available. Previously available, the data was Google Maps and uh, imagery of about 50 centimeter pixel resolution. So it's quite a bit more accurate if we're talking about sort of sub five centimeter pixel accuracy. Um, the coastline was also was also mapped with at higher accuracies than previously available, which in turn will make modeling of the coastline much much more accurate. Also because of the control that the end user has of the data, it will be easier and more accurate when resurveying the coastline as the techniques used will be the same and rem will remove some of the errors that can occur when you go from one technique to another. And finally, uh, the higher accuracy data is found at lower elevations and at greater overlap. So if you want high accuracy data, use greater overlap and lower elevations. However, that doesn't mean that you should always use this because the, at the lower elevations and greater overlap I mean you can't cover as large an area. So ultimately it's very important to understand what accuracy needs you have for your specific project to make sure that you're covering as much, you're able to collect the data that you want as efficiently as possible. So just a couple uh, future possible uses in archaeology. Um, one of the ones that I thought would be really interesting is uh, getting good accurate imagery of the structural wood, which is this from an archaeological dig, and then helping using that data to help map the sites. Um, currently, it's all done by hand, which takes a long time, I'm told. I'm, they never let me do it, so. <laughs> um, so basically mapping that, I think you could do it in sort of an hour versus Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, I also think uh, the total station maps that they made of the area could be replaced by UAV maps in the future. However, for both of these uses to be adopted by archaeologists, I think there needs to be a greater uh, 
trust in the UAV in general, which will be which will occur based on uh, using it, seeing it, being comfortable with the data it pushes out, as well as a stronger theoretical background in data accuracies. So that's there it is. Um, I'd just like to thank the NSTP, SHIRK, University of Calgary, the Department of Geography, the Polar Continental Shelf Program, um, NIAI instead of Pete because he's not here, <laughs> Max, Friesen, and Brian Mormon. Uh, well, minus it, the minus the, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, Brian probably knows better. I don't spend the money. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole range. Yeah. yeah. Right? The ones we use are sort of do-it-yourself, assemble it yourself, and it only costs $3,000 for the laptop, and the whole kit, right. basically. Or you can have a completely pre-made, ready-to-fly system that you can spend up $80. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right now, it's really it's the very beginning of that industry, yeah. and so there's a lot of variation. Sure. Yeah. 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 Couple. How big a step is it to go from that to stereoscopic imagery? Oh, that's that's the goal. Is it's okay. it is stereo? It should be stereo. It will be and is currently being becoming <laughs> stereoscopic <laughs> imagery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> That's uh, right. And thirdly, uh, not to put you on the spot, but can you share an example of something the archaeologist wouldn't want? <laughs> well, <laughs> so that was one of the yeah. advantages of being. Where did they take to tell you to take a hike? <laughs> Just well, I mean, mostly of all when they're digging, for example. Like I was thinking, uh, removing soil and stuff might be useful, like to measure, because you can measure volumetrically by taking a. Uh, stereoscopic vision and then as they dig down and I think it'd be very interesting and it's a great way to measure the accuracy through volumetrics of the actual unit but I don't think archaeologists would find a great use for that I'm not interested yeah Thank you. it's just off the top of my head so <laughs> yeah. so I just have one question and that is did you have any issue, any permitting or any kinds of issues related to no. flying UAVs over what I'm guessing is no comment. Maybe out of the territory. I mean, I just, because this is, I'm used to working in Alaska, and this yeah. used to come up quite a bit. In Canada, you have to have a special flight yeah. operation system. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do. Okay. That's yeah. what I wondered. Did you do it? It's Alaska? way easier flying to Canada. Yeah. And, like, it's. <laughs> well, I know that, I, I know, I worked with a scientist in Fairbanks, and they actually had the um, U.S. Aviation Authority came out. And wanted them to have trained yeah. pilots to fly them. Yeah, like I know in America it's basically, I mean, not impossible, but you really have to want to go and do it. In Canada, with an SFOC, um, anyone can apply for it and they will grant it. It takes a lot of time, like three or four months. And they'll, uh, if, if your grant isn't good enough, et cetera, et cetera, they'll say you have to limit it here, here, and here. And there's, but it's quite not hard to obtain, but. Doable. <laughs> oh, uh, yes, quite affected. I think that's a definitely a limiting <laughs> factor, <laughs> undoubtedly. <laughs> no, I would say like uh, winds of sort of uh, below 10 kilometers an hour. I mean, it's definitely a limiting factor. However, I think the fact that you're able to have it ready and fly it in 15 minutes means you wait for a calm period and go. As opposed, I think airplanes, people often say, well, airplanes don't have limiting factors. Well, cloud cover is a limiting factor, and that ruins a whole day. I don't know. Well, that's actually really good for us. Yeah, that's true. And the sunlight goes through the clouds, yeah. makes a nice diffuse light. There's no shadows. I don't know if you saw it. You know, space 
when you're flying a hug, we actually have to do that. Yeah. It's probably better so our next speaker is Tyler Murchie from the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology and he's going to talk to us about ancient DNA analysis of plants from archaeologically associated alpine ice patches in the Yukon Territory. And next year, we're going to limit titles to six words, because <laughs> they're all really long. Well, thanks for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. Uh, so in 2012, Gerald Holdsworth, a glaciologist, recovered this particular unmodified stick uh, from Kalani National Park, Yukon, uh, about 20 kilometers from Mount Logan. Now, Mount Logan is the second highest mountain in North America with an elevation of about 6,000 meters above sea level. Um, and just to make sure we're all spatially situated here, Colonia National Park is located in the southwestern portion of the Yukon here, associated with Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve uh, on the Alaskan side of the border, and also with this junction of borders between British Columbia, Yukon, and the Alaskan Panhandle. And as far as our archaeological culture area goes, um, it's situated within the subarctic uh, boreal forest with close associations to the northwest coast. So the interesting aspect about that particular specimen is its remoteness. Uh, so it's found here in the St. Elias Range, uh, which is a small part of the um, coast mountain system that runs down the west coast. Uh, and this is an elevation map of that area of southern Yukon, BC, and Alaska. A radiocarbon analysis of the stick found that it was about 2,500 years old, uh, and it was determined to belong to the genus Salix, or willow, and it's about 1.3 meters long. So one of the questions is, why is this particular specimen here, when it's between 50 and 100 kilometers from the modern tree line? Could this be related to glacial travel as, our, as prehistoric groups moved between the coast and the interior? And similar specimens have been found in other uh, alpine ice patch sites throughout the northwestern subarctic. And just to give you an idea of kind of the remoteness of this specimen, this is a um, glacial extent, modern glacial extent of the area, uh, fairly low resolution, but you can see that it's um, quite far into the ice fields here. So why does this stick even matter? Um, well, there's very little archaeological evidence for the contact between Tlingit groups on, on the northwest coast and Athabascans in the interior. Uh, in this map here, we have the Athabascan groups outlined with red uh, and, and yellow, and then we have the Tlingit uh, northwest coast groups here. Um, however, there is a good deal of ethnohistorica evidence for coastal interior trade and intermarriage between these two groups. Archaeologically, the evidence only really goes back maybe until contact or 100 or 200 years before that. Oral narratives, however, suggest um, trade, glacial highways, and migration over millennia in this particular area. So one of the questions is, when did people start moving between the coast and the interior in this area, and when did it become an important part of their lifeway? And the Logan stick, as I've been referring to it as, might be the earliest archaeological evidence of these movements. So probably one of the most um, well-known aspects of uh, Yukon or uh, subarctic archaeology recently are ice patches. Uh, these features were discovered in uh, 1999 for their archaeological and paleobiological importance. Uh, ice patches are areas of permanent alpine ice that form due to the gradual accumulation of snow as it's compressed into lenses. And caribou uh, regulate these areas, or go to these areas uh, to thermoregulate and to escape insect harassment during the summer months. Humans exploited this to hunt caribou at these locations, leaving an extremely well-preserved series of remains, dating back in some cases around 8,000 years, and with continuous occupation throughout. And the materials found here are really well-preserved. So we have an arrow shaft here with sinew and fletching still attached, and a whole variety of, of other faunal and floral materials. Um, importantly, about 95% of the materials found in ice patches, the archaeological ones, are wooden. And this is opposed to around 1% of wooden materials found at typical subarctic sites. And this is due to the acidic soils common in the boreal forest. So I, 
uh, traveled to Whitehorse to um, sample some of these specimens for a genetic analysis in 2013. Uh, and so the purple dots here are areas where ice patches where some of these samples were found, and the green dots are areas where I sampled modern specimens to understand the genetic differentiation uh, between the boreal forest and the um, hemlock rainforest on the coast. And this was associated with a whole bunch of great field adventures. <laughs> I went back uh, this last field season to gather additional samples in Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Uh, these green dots here, and I also collected further ones along the coast, uh, further to the west, to understand the genetic differentiation between willow as I move along uh, the west coast. Oh, and this is all in, in um, to understand where this particular specimen was coming from, and these are all um, isolated by high mountain ranges. So you expect that they would, the mountains would act as vicarians that would allow genetic drift to build up in these isolated populations. And again, this. Uh, it was associated with a lot of great field adventures. Uh, this top image here is of Mount Logan um, from Alaska. So why even bother using molecular yeah. methods in this instance? instance? Well, morphological character analysis um, of paleobotanicals and even uh, modern willow samples uh, can have a poor resolution at low taxonomic levels. Uh, and this just refers to being able to uh, differentiate between species and a genus. Additionally, using um, molecular methods may allow for population identifications um, due to genetic drift because of the vicariance of those mountain ranges. Unfortunately, there have been few ancient DNA studies done with plants to date. Um, the ones that have been done are use seeds, gourd rinds, maize cobs, and to a lesser extent, wooden materials. And this is for a variety of reasons, um, and the most important of which is that degradation of genetic material uh, tends to be quite severe in wood. The only area we'd really expect to, fi to find viable nuclei in wood is in the vascular cambium here, um, as all the other wood cells in the tree had died during the lifetime of the organism and remained there for structural support. So they've already gone through natural autolytic processes. Uh, additionally, uh, inhibitory substances that affect PCR, which is the method used to amplify DNA, tend to be more severe in wood, especially in decayed wood. Uh, and I, I found uh, contamination can be an important factor. Uh, I'm looking at chloroplast DNA, and I have had positive applications for green algae in some of my wood samples. Uh, and finally, most of the work that has been done with degraded wood sampling has been for timber tracking. So although it's a similar sort of idea, the wood that they're looking at in those studies is not nearly as degraded as 2,000 years old, for example. Uh, so I've been doing this work in the ancient DNA lab here at the UC, which was built in 2011. Uh, and it has all the um, standard protocols associated with most ancient DNA labs uh, built nowadays. So separate workspaces, HEPA filtered and UV rated ventilation, positive pressure airflow, UV light decontamination cycles, et cetera. Uh, and this is in addition to dedicated clothing, individual full body suits and masks for each individual workspace, and one way traffic between the ancient DNA lab here uh, in the, or over in the Earth Science Building, and then the uh, post PCR facility in biological sciences. Uh, and this far, I've been analyzing a variety of genetic loci. Um, so these are all ones that have been found uh, in other studies to be uh, viable loci for differentiating populations or at least species of willow. And so I've been analyzing these. Uh, the ones in orange are ones that I've extracted from a lot of the modern specimens uh, to understand their ability to differentiate the um, samples. And then the ones in purple here, uh, or dark blue, I submitted earlier this morning. So hopefully I'll get the sequences back for those soon. Uh, thus far, um, I've found a surprising lack of polymorphic regions in willow, which is surprising because these are all different species from different areas. Uh, and this is in contrast to some other studies that have found um, the ability to ge uh, geographically differentiate some willow species. So as for the objectives moving forward for this project, uh, the first is con to continue testing different loci to find polymorphic regions, and this is just continuing to test all the samples that I gathered in 2013 and 2014. And then finally, once I find uh, viable um, genetic loci that I can use for 
by like, geographically differentiating the samples to test these with the ancient specimens. And then finally to um, use this data to better assess the geographic origins of the so-called Logan stick um, to better understand manuports in a variety of other alpine areas in the subarctic. Uh, and there's a whole variety of people that um, I'd like to thank for helping out with the project, uh, no, most notably, of course, the Arctic Institute, uh, as well as Peter Dawson, Camilla Speller, Gerald Holdsworth, Jeff Hunston, Gregory Hare, uh, Brian Coyman, and uh, Sean Rogers for uh, allowing me to use his molecular ecology lab in uh, BioSci. Thank you. Um, so I do all the processing work and then we just send off the purified DNA for sequencing and it usually takes a day or two. I could do the sequencing here, um, but there's been some technical issues with setting it up for us to do it, so we just um, pay to have it sequenced elsewhere. Does it cost much? Ten bucks a sample. I kind of asked, that was the question I was going to ask, so we'll go to another one, which is much lighter. Are you in any of those white suits? Yeah, I, I was in I was in one of the ones there at the at the bottom. Okay. So which do you prefer, field outfit or the white? <laughs> uh, definitely uh, field. The uh, it's it's really uncomfortable <laughs> working in those labs because it's really hot yeah. and you sweat the whole time and you have the suit on and you can't drink any water and if you're in there for eight, nine, ten hours, it's. And you commonly have to. Um, for some of my stuff, I I've pick too large a sample size to process in one day, and then I stayed there way too long. So I just need to get used to having smaller goals so I can get out of there sooner and not try myself so crazy. <laughs> so how long will it take you to prepare um, The process is about three days uh, if you were doing it straight, and each day maybe four, five, six hours, up to 10 hours, depending on how many samples you're doing, uh, and then sending it off for sequencing. But if you did the sequencing here, it would just be another additional day on top of that. So. Uh, in Willow, one study found it in, uh, I forget which state it was in, but they found it within the state, so I thought that was good evidence that it would be able to. There's another study that argued that there was no geographic structuring, but they are using a different kind of technique. Um, they were um, sequencing the DNA directly, uh, so I attributed it to that, um, but it's appearing in these samples that there um, is at least low geographic structuring anyway. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm collecting them on either side of the Coast Mountain Range, and that the St. Elias Range has it's like five of North America's highest mountains in it. Yeah. So it's it's surprising that they would be so genetically similar in so many different uh, um, regions that I tested, and they're all different species too. I tried to collect all the different species as I could um, because the archaeological samples hadn't been identified to the species level yet. So I just wanted to get as broad of a sample base as I could. Um, not, not off the top of my head, no. It, it's pretty variable, though, for species and um, things like that, but yeah, I'm not sure. Thanks.
As for the title to my proposed research was the interactions between an ice dam lake and a polythermal glacier. Uh, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, glaciers provide one of the most visible indications of global warming. In order to comprehend glacial dynamics, it is essential to understand glacial hydrology. Global warming, glacial dynamics, and glacial hydrology are important for understanding changes in glacier melt and runoff. In the future, this is expected to have enormous social, economic, and environmental implications. So my study area was very similar to Michelle's study area. Uh, we were studying in Nunavut in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago on an island called Violet Island, which is located in Smerlick National Park. And this island is 45% covered by glaciers. And we were both studying on Fountain Glacier, or close to Fountain Glacier, which is officially named Glacier B26. <coughs> and importantly, this is a polythermal glacier. Uh, this is a picture of the terminus, so just the bottom section of the glacier. And we camped on the tundra just next to the glacier. Uh, so in order to get to our study site, we hiked from camp all the way along the edge of the glacier up to Patterson Lake. Uh, so my proposed research topic was to study this lake, and this is an image of it in July of 2011. And this is an image of it when we got there this summer. And we named it the Patterson Puddle. This is a picture of me when I realized after 10 months of writing my proposal, I was most definitely not able to do a project on this lake as it wasn't there. <laughs> Don't be fooled, I'm smiling just for the camera. So my new project was <laughs> is to study the evolution of the superglacial streams on the surface of Mountain Glacier. This is just a little bit about the background of superglacial streams. Uh, typically, they develop on the surface of polythermal glaciers. And this is because polythermal glaciers have a warm core at zero degrees. And then they have this outer fringe that is below zero degrees. So the water stays on the surface because it's unable to penetrate through the glacier. Another important characteristic is that uh, superglacial streams form in areas where the stream bed erosion is greater than the rate of glacier ablation. Uh, so what that means is the stream bed is actually eroding away faster than the glacier is melting or ablating. And then another important point is they vary in size. The superglacial streams vary in size from a few centimeters across to several meters in depth and width. So I have two main research questions. The first is what factors cause large superglacial canyons to form on the surface of the glacier? So as you can see, there are two large canyons on the surface of Fountain Glacier, and these are extremely unique. As I just mentioned, uh, usually they're only a few meters uh, in width and depth at max. And also on this image, you can see uh, where my central superglacial stream is located. It's kind of small, so you can't see it, but it runs along uh, up to here and down off the glacier right there. And my second research question is what causes a superglacial stream to pulse, and what influence does this pulse have on its evolution? Uh, so halfway through my study, uh, something weird started to happen. And I'll tell you or show you what I mean by pulse. But essentially the change, uh, the stream started to change in discharge. So the first week and a half, my study was going well and everything was normal and this is what my stream looked like. It just fell off the glacier normally. And then suddenly, it would pulse, as in completely stop, and then turn itself back on. And this is pretty unnormal. <laughs> it's really not normal. Um, so my main objective is to understand what factors uh, cause 
the evolution of the supraglacial streams on Fountain Glacier. Specifically, I want to know what causes the pulsing of the central supraglacial stream. I want to know if Fountain Glacier has the largest supraglacial canyons in the world, and if so, I obviously want to know why. And I want to be able to predict whether the central supraglacial stream will form another canyon in the future. However, uh, during our research, we had a few minor challenges. So as I mentioned, uh, we camped on the tundra, and you can actually see my stream. It's the one on the left. And here it is again in the center of the glacier. However, there is a stream that comes along in between our camp and the glacier. So the first way we uh, used to cross the stream was to cross by boat, which was a lot of fun. The second way was to cross using chest waders uh, farther upstream. And then after a few days of rain, neither of those ways were safe. So I took a hike up Glacier to see if I could find a safer way to cross. And I hiked and hiked and hiked and hiked and hiked. Up until the point where the stream actually becomes a stream, because up until this point, it's actually groundwater. Except the problem with that is it took me all day just to actually get to my study area. So the next day, we asked the helicopter, and they so kindly dropped us on the glacier surface, right at my study site. So you're probably wondering what I actually did on the glacier. Um, first, I measured the stream discharge. I put a pressure transducer in the stream, and I will be able to calculate discharge from that. I drilled holes in the glacier surface uh, little ones, and placed doweling in the holes. And on a frequent basis, I measured the uh, amount of doweling sticking out of the ice. And from that, I will be able to calculate the ablation of the surface. Uh, also, I used a high precision GPS to measure the erosion of the actual stream bed. And I did that twice, once at the beginning of my study and once at the end. So I'll be able to compare the results. And as I mentioned, I, my stream started to pulse halfway through, so I set up a time-lapse camera. And as you can see, these images are taken a minute apart. And in this image, there is water, and in this one, there is not. And lastly, I have a few different sources of weather data. Uh, Brian has been going up to Violet for many years and has a few weather stations on the island. I also have the Environment Canada data from Pond Inlet, which is the closest community. And I set up a precipitation gauge on the surface of the glacier. So this is how all of my data goes together. I'm going to use air photos to, compo to compare the historical and present images to understand the evolution of the canyon. And then I'm going to use all of the field data I collected to actually be able to understand how the channel evolved. And with all of this, I will hopefully understand the factors that influence the evolution of the superglacial streams on the surface of Fountain Glacier. So I have three main conclusions. First, interesting and unique phenomena occur in the Arctic. Fieldwork often involves unexpected events. <laughs> And it's extremely important to be adaptable to the constant changes that are most definitely going to occur. Uh, so lastly, I'd just like to give a special thanks to all of the funding agencies, Brian Mormon, my supervisor, my field partner, Michelle, and the three British professors that were with us on the island. Thank you. Uh, the one that I walked across? Yeah. Um, it's oh, melt. No, sorry, not the one you walked across, the one you're studying. The one I'm studying? Yeah. It's just melt of the glacier. Um, but I, sorry, as you 
follow the canyon up, is there some point that it's just coming right along the course? Yeah, it's coming out of the glacier right at the right at the snout. Is that that was the pulsing? Uh, the pulsing is from the waterfall. Yeah. And then upstream, it's just melts from the glacier, okay. causing. But, but there's no. I don't think so. Okay. So are these are these canyons that you're seeing very different than the huge incisions they see on the Greenland ice cap? Um, I believe the processes are different. I haven't done a complete lit review. Okay. We, um, which is fair considering I completely changed my topic and I've only <laughs> it's only been a week. Um, in the last week, I've actually been reading a bit about that. Um, yes and no. Um, they look similar, but I believe the processes are different. <laughs> yes? What do you think happened to your lake? Um, it actually carved its way alongside the glacier, and it's just a river now. Um, well, it was at one point. Um, it just drained beside the glacier. I thought it was ice dammed, um, but obviously thermal erosion just caused it to melt away or blow away. Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Josh. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you guys about parasites and musk oxen. So to give you a reference as to where we were working this past summer, we were up on Victoria Island, uh, basically straight north of Calgary. It's a big island. It's the second largest in um, Canada at uh, 2,200 square kilometers. It's split down the middle by the uh, Northwest Territories Nunavut border, uh, which can make permits a little bit of a nightmare, but luckily we just stayed on the Nunavut side. Uh, there's two hamlets on the island, Cambridge Bay down in the southeast, uh, and then uh, Holman, that's the one, up in the northwest. And uh, an important thing to note was this island was completely covered during the uh, Wisconsin glaciation. Uh, about 18,000 years ago, meaning that it was void of all uh, slugs, which I'll talk about later. <laughs> uh, so in this presentation, we're going to look at uh, the musk oxen, uh, slugs and snails, or gastropods, and then lungworms. And I'll dive into those a little d uh, deeper. So musk ox, they're an arctic ungulate. Um, they're localized, so their, their core population is in North America up on the uh, Arctic archipelago. They also have a uh, population up on uh, northern Greenland as well, uh, shown in the red there, sorry. Uh, the blue is introduced populations. Uh, they've tried introductions uh, almost around the whole Arctic there. Um, they have a small herd size. They range uh, usually about 20 to 30 animals. Um, they're sedentary, meaning they don't do any prolonged migrations. They're not like caribou. Uh, they're a keystone species, and what I mean by that is that they're heavily relied on by both the Inuit communities and the large predators on the island for subsistence. 
and Victoria Island holds 20 to 30 percent of the global muskox population. So gastropods, uh, pretty simple, they're slugs or snails, they require a lot of moisture because they are soft and slimy, and they are important intermediate hosts for quite a number of parasites. And last but not least is the protostrongylids, which are cyst-forming lung nematodes of mammals. They have an indirect life cycle, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, important to note, there's two species on Victoria Island, Veristrongylus and Umingmax strongylus, which I'll just refer to as UP for the rest of the slideshow. Um, UP only infects musk oxen, Veristrongylus infects both caribou and musk oxen. And both of these uh, became recently established on the island, which I'll also speak about a little bit later. So the, life, the indirect life cycle that I mentioned earlier begins with an adult worm that's residing in a cyst in the muskox lung. This uh, produces thousands of uh, first stage larvae, which the muskox coughs up, swallows, and then excretes in its feces. Um, a lucky slug or snail will crawl by and become infected, uh, potentially become infected with one of these first stage larvae. Um, from there, they develop into a third stage larvae in the in the gastropod host, and there they can either become, uh, they can either be uh, accidentally consumed by a grazing muskox, or they can emerge and lay dormant on the tundra, and be consumed by a muskox grazing. So, the whole problem, I guess, or the background to the, what's happening up there right now is that there's these two lungworm species that are very common on the. Uh, the mainland that recently jumped up onto uh, Victoria Island. So UP it's thought or it's hypothesized that it actually moved up onto the island via stochastic muskox movement, just random movement between the island and mainland by a muskox. 2008, it first appeared on the southwest corner of the island. 2012, it showed up 300 kilometers to the east. Veristrongylus, on the other hand, was thought to, this is the one that affects uh, caribou and muskox, was thought to come, uh, come across by the uh, migrating caribou herd, which starts down here on the main line and basically works its way in calves up here in the northwest corner. Um, and it crossed uh, around 2010. And it's thought to be established because it has, in, has an increasing prevalence in muskox. And so my research question uh, was, whether the distribution and abundance of intermediate hosts was limiting the expansion and establishment of lungworms on the island. And because it's a big island, we had to take a step back and really plan how we were going to sample this. So we took some of the work from my, uh, my colleague who's looking at where these lungworms are by looking through a lot of poop. And uh, we found that there was a nice uh, trend kind of north-south here or that's anyways where they sampled. Um, essentially all the colored dots are infected animals and all the black dots are not infected animals. So we figured uh, we'd have a nice latitudinal gradient here to sample across. Next we looked at climate data and uh, we looked at the average temperature and average precipitation. And we kind of established these uh, three zones where it was uh, a little bit warmer here, a little bit cooler, and then coolest up here. We figured there might be some difference uh, for whether or not these could host uh, gastropods. So again, we threw up those lines and it worked out so that there was this almost perfect north-south uh, line. And then we picked our five sites. Um, we went up to Hadley Bay on the very north side. We went to uh, this big desert that's right in the center of the island. Tahoe Lake, Little Surrey Lake, and Byron Bay on the south coast. Um, what we did when we were at these sites, we visited these five sites and we, uh, we had these 10 by 20 meter plots with 50 mats, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and these were sampled over two days. So this mat technique, uh, it's basically a modified cardboard technique. It's a sheet of quilting material uh, soaked in water, and it was baited with grape juice. Uh, we wanted to bring beer, but that wasn't logistically feasible. Um, this is a great method for sampling over a large space. It's quick and easy, um, and it's relatively reliable, but not 
for quantification. So we can't get any abundance data from this. So we went with a secondary method, which is a turf flooding technique, which basically involved taking a pail, pulling out a plug of soil, covering it with a lid, and flooding it gradually over 12 hours. Uh, the thought behind this is that uh, any gastropods that are in the pail would climb the sides or the vegetation, and you can hand pick them and get an idea of what the abundance is. This was used successfully by my supervisor, and uh, it is designed for quantification. So it was our backup. However, from last summer, we know that it wouldn't detect very low abundance. Uh, anyways, so what we did find was this one species of gastropod, it's Durosaurus leve. It's a meadow slug. On the left, you can see there's quite a variable uh, size difference, anywhere from 5 to 25 millimeters. Uh, we know that it's able to host both species of lungworms, which is uh, good, I guess. Um, and another thing we noticed when we were sampling was that the capture success varied greatly by the weather conditions. So we'd catch a lot more slugs after it rained and during the, the nighttime when the sun wasn't shining maybe as hard. So this, was, this shows uh, what basically we found in terms of presence and abundance. The green arrows was where we found slugs. The red arrows where we didn't find slugs. We kind of noticed there's a trend in abundance here from, I guess, from the south to the north and also from the west to the east. Um, but what we wanted to know was were these two sites here, or sorry, sites that we found slugs, were they actually different from sites that we didn't find slugs, or was this just an artifact of uh, variable sampling conditions? So we decided to, uh, I, I went ahead and compared these two sites, Tahoe Lake is this guy here, and then Byron Bay down on the south. And uh, we looked at both the, the ground temperature and the ground humidity at these two sites over the course of whatever it was, 36 hours. And there was three sampling periods at each site. We could see at the first sampling, there's not a, a lot of difference between the two sites here. Maybe uh, three or four degrees warmer. Humidity is about the same. Uh, second, the second sampling, it's a little bit warmer again at Tahoe, but uh, again, same uh, humidity. And same goes for the third. It's a little bit warmer, but close to the same humidity. So. What that tells us is that the sampling conditions weren't all that different. So if slugs were there, we probably should have found them. Um, so I'll bring you back to that lungworm presence map that I showed you earlier. So there is this huge grouping of uh, infected animals, but we didn't find any slugs there. So right now, our, our, my only conclusion is that the, uh, the slug abundance was too low, that we, we weren't able to find them in that uh, two-day sampling period, or that it's a huge area, maybe we just sampled the, the wrong meadow. Uh, the conclusions that, uh, or the preliminary, I guess, conclusions that I was able to come up with is that the meadow slug is the only terrestrial gastropod present on the central and eastern part of Victoria Island. There's both that latitudinal and longitudinal uh, trend in slug abundance. And gastropods are likely limiting the lungworm establishment further north on the island. Moving forward, um, I'd like to look at the, uh, the influence of gastro gastropod abundance on the lungworm prevalence, uh, how the temperature and humidity affected the slug activity on the tundra surface. And going from that, whether or not we can take that data and forecast peak lungworm infection periods from, uh, from climate data. Uh, I'd like to thank the following people and all the people that uh, funded me to go up north. Uh, it was an awesome time, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Sorry, yeah, that maybe I went a little bit fast through that. They do need a gastropod to so complete their. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to follow up on that, then, do you, have you had the opportunity to get a sense of what meadow slug distribution through the larger archipelago looks like, or do you not just have any data? 
Yeah, the data is not there. This is like the third survey on Victoria Island, I think, aside from my supervisor's previous one. So the data just isn't there right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, there's, well, there's two methods. They either, well, these guys, they deep freeze. They uh, pump glycol into their system and bury down in the ground and freeze themselves, essentially. Uh, I don't, it's up for debate whether they lay eggs in those and they all die off, but I think that, uh, yeah, they just deep freeze. What's the limiting factor? What's the limiting factor? There must be, because if they're deep freezing, they're not going to I'm assuming they're moving north, right? Which can create some rainfall and ground temperature. Or, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 really slowly, but slowly. Yeah. That's pretty fast, actually. Yeah. 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 That's pretty fast, actually. Yeah. But uh, is that the idea that climate has yeah. Yeah. What is what migrating? Oh, assuming that they were the island, like I said, was glaciated 20,000 years ago, they had to be migrating slowly. <laughs> What's that? Across the ice? Yeah, I don't know. Do you have a question? For sure. I have no idea, but. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends on the lungworm. Like, the one that just infects them, I can't remember. But the other one, we just completed the life cycle in the muskox up at uh, Spy Hill, and it was a couple of months. Oh, that's fast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. <laughs>